the fucking marching. It ain't no justice, ain't no peace, and I won't sleep until the What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access, and today we have the honor of being joined by Eastside K-Boy. Thank you for coming through, sir. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, I got to say, I was, uh, you know, obviously I knew your work and knew stuff you had done with Glasses and a lot of the other uh, great artists we have here in Los Angeles, but when Battle Cat had, uh, posted the BLM song you did on his Instagram and I saw that, I was like, man, we got to get him on Unique Access because this song, unfortunately, is right on time. And, and it's a phenomenal song, in my opinion. And it speaks to a lot of the atrocities that have been going on for a long time. So thanks for coming through to talk with us about that and about the rest of your career. So um, I knew it through, I heard it through Battle Cat and then uh, Pooh, your manager, Pooh Lampkin, at uh, you know, tag me on it to make sure I saw it. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, I know uh, I know Battle Cat and I'd interviewed Dem Joints uh, when Exhibit and I had Open Bar Radio on K-Day. So to, to see that in, embracement, uh, being embraced by those two, I was like, that makes it even more special to me. So let's start with the Black Leadership Militia, just the name of it, um, instead of Black Lives Matter or making it mean something else. What specifically about uh, Black Leadership Militia made it work for you? I felt like, you know, uh, Black Lives Matters was, it's, it's becoming a cliche with the BLM. And I just wanted to uh, call my song something a little bit more impactful and meaningful. And the state of mind that I'm in right now is militant. So, and I know that I'm a leader, especially when it comes to the inner city, especially my section, but coming from the east side. So I just feel like it was just right on time and the, the title was perfect. I didn't want to really uh, try to get in depth and detail of it. I just, that was the first thing that I thought about. And it just came just like that. And I said, you know what, that's going to be the title. Um, it's still BLM, you know, for music wise, it's still a good hashtag. So, but I just wanted to do something that was more uh, powerful. Okay. And then how did the connection with them joints work for this song? You know, it's so funny, you know, like how you say, you know, my work with being with Glasses from when I was younger, I've been knowing them joints when he was producing for the group, the Frontliners back in the day. So he's always been there. You know, that's always been a friend of mine. So um, what happened was I posted them joints a uh, video that he did with the young, the young kid, the 12 year old kid. I forget his name, but it was just a, a, a strong, powerful message from the child and them joints actually put the music behind it i reposted it so we started having conversations about it and uh i asked them joints man would it be possible can i do a verse on it i said even if i'm not on a real song i just want to be able to you know put my input on the song so by him being them joints he sent me the record anyway before i can even begin to write my 16 he called me right back immediately like look man buster's on the other line he wants it too but it just got crazy for me. Uh, we're going to have to put a, a, a halt to you rapping on the song. He said, don't worry, though. I got a beat perfect for you. He sent it to me. As soon as he sent it, I listened to it for a while. I'm like, this is something that I'm not used to. Them joints always make me think and, you know, push my creativity when he sends me music. So I'm like, okay, this is not really my, my cup of tea beat. But then I played it in the studio on a loudspeaker, and the first bar came out. I ain't doing no motherfucking marching. And from then on, history in the making, hopefully. Yeah, it's definitely one of the most powerful songs I've heard in a while, which is why I, you know, reached, reached out when Pooh had hit me. So that was, uh, I'm glad that you decided to come through, man. But let's get to a lot of the song. But before we do, I wanted to know how did, uh, you know, how Battle Cat got a hold of it and decided to post it? I don't know. Now, you know, I'm familiar with everybody because I came up with everybody, especially when I was younger. I was always the youngest. So, uh, you know, I'm real tight with Mike Shaw, which is Battle Cat's younger brother. So I don't know how he came, you know, came up on seeing it. Maybe he seen it on my page. Maybe somebody sent it to him. I, I'm not sure. We had a long conversation the next day after he posted it on FaceTime, me and Battle Cat. But he just said he just felt the energy and it was just right on time. Like how you said, he said he had to post it. It was his job to post it so i don't know who actually sent it to him 
because I would love to give him credit. I don't know. But when he posted it, it brought a different attention to me, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, for those that haven't heard Eastside K-Boys BLM, please, you know, after you listen to what he has to say for the interview, make sure to go listen to it. Black Leadership Militia is a phenomenal song. So we're going to walk through the song a lot of it Um, because, of course, the nation is in upheaval with all the racial atrocities that have been going on for centuries. Then we got the pandemic with COVID-19. No doubt. Of course, most recently we got George Floyd, but people act like this is brand new. And one of the great things I think you do in BLM is really break down a lot of the historical stuff that has sadly led to what we're going through now. And early in the song, you talk about Huey Newton, Tukey Williams, Malcolm X, Bunchy Carter, Nat Turner, like you're a combination of all that. So why those, what did you take from each one of them that's inspired you till today? So I, I love documentaries. So uh, I know I need to read more like my father, Soldier Nip does. And they always told me to pick up these books, but um, I love documentaries. So I always watch documentaries with Huey P. Newton, Bunchy Carter, you know, um, Tucky Williams was always an influence because obviously I'm a crip. But I know his intentions wasn't what's going on right now in the gang community. So I know it was it was a it was supposed to be a, a spin off the Panthers actually. So I know by being a crib and the acronym is Community Revolution of Progress, I feel like we have to get back to that. So he was getting to that. Unfortunately, the Terminator gave him the lethal injection. So uh he couldn't be here to help be a voice to what's going on right now because he had the power to do so behind the wall. So I felt like I never been to the penitentiary, but by me being a voice in my community and by me being a crip, I embody some of his traits. Huey P. Newton it was just a prolific leader and he knew a lot of things about the government. And he was speaking on a lot of things that was before his time. And he was young when he was doing it too. He was talking about the Pentagon. And I used to say, Back then, they was hiding education from black men. How did he even have the knowledge or come up to find these these readings and studies about the Pentagon and the government and what was going on? Like, he was really speaking powerful and ahead of his time. And, you know, intelligently at that time, Nat Turner was rebellious, if anybody knows the story about Nat Turner. And I feel like this song is rebellion because I'm not doing the, the we shall overcome, the let's hold hands, and I'm not... I'm really talking about fighting back right? because we, we've done that years ago already. We tried to be peaceful. We tried to march. We tried to cry. We did everything we tried to do peacefully. And our ancestors just tried to do so much politically correct that nobody was hearing. And that's what Martin Luther King said, you know, the riding and looting is the voice of the unheard. So I agree with it. Two wrongs make a right. No, Soren, it doesn't. But at the end of the day, it's going to get your attention. Now that I got your attention, now listen to me. Now listen to my concerns and my demands that I have for my community and all across the world. So that's why I chose those people because they were just so powerful. Bunchy Carter was another one too. It's it's so many other more people. Like the song could have went on, but I don't want to start boring you with a five minute song, you know. But it's no, so many more people. I think it's powerful. And and back to them joints for one second. The the power of the song is not only lyrically but musically because the beat is so muscular and so forceful and so powerful that it's one of those songs and this happens i think when we have the best political rap the best conscious rap the best gangster rap whatever the best rap has that element of the sonics and the lyrics matching so well and i think that's a testament to what you did over them joints so congratulations for that i think it's amazing and I think, I that, that. yeah, yeah. And I think that leads into a lot of what you're saying, because one of the things that, you know, I know from talking to my friends and obviously you articulate in the song is like, there's four of you and one of me. How could I be a threat? So for you, why was that important to mention in the song? It's very important that I mentioned that to let you know that I'm one man and it's four other men and you're trying to detain me. He was a big man. We seen that. We know that. But seeing the videos, we weren't there. But seeing the videos and the angles, it really looked like he wasn't doing anything 
to be uh, threatened, were threatenful to, towards the officers at all. It just seemed like he was a big guy. He probably was resisting, but their resistance is different. You know, sometimes we wiggle off the handcuffs may be, may be too tight or what have you, but we don't really know because we wasn't there. But at the same time, you could have used a different tactic. But that's all the time that we ask you guys to use a different tactic. You don't have to be that forceful and to just put your knee on a human being neck for so long without a care in the world is disturbing to me. You had your hand in your pocket. That's a sign of you was comfortable. And then you, if you really pay close attention to details, like you're rocking back and forth, like you're doing it intentionally, like you knew that you can kill this person. And that's what you wanted to do. And when he lost consciousness, you were still on his neck. It's for y'all and it's one of me. How am I threat? If y'all wanted to, all three of y'all could have slammed me, hog tied me, put me in, in the back of the, of the car, took me to the print scene. But you didn't do that. So I just don't understand it. I really don't. I never, I, I will never understand it. The force that the police officers use. It's not all of them, but from my upbringing and saying, I've never seen a nice cop. Right. Well, I think one of the things that uh, the song BLM does a good job of articulating and discussing is that lack of understanding. And one of your other lyrics in there was talking about how would you feel if we come and beat and killed your white child? And I think for the first time, maybe some white people or some people that don't have direct experience with this are finally seeing it maybe a little bit, which maybe is leading to the uprising and the protests we're seeing. But for you, with that lyric, why was that important to say in the song? You have to have some type of understanding. And I think not all white people, because of course, look at you. You've been in hip hop for so long. Like I've watched you too and followed you too. So you have understanding of what goes on in the inner city, in the black community. So. By saying that is, everybody's looking like, why are the community is such an uproar? Why are they so upset? Why are they so mad? It's another mother. Unfortunately, she's not even living for that man to call for his mother. And she's deceased anyway. That's another painful subject to get on. But even then, it's black mothers lose their sons every day. Already in my own community. You feel me? That's another conversation too, but we're gonna stay on the subject in hand is by the crooked police. It's just, I have to say that because you guys will be in an uproar as well. Oh, and it's, it will be a lot of modern day lynching if that happened. If a black cop put his knee on a white man for eight minutes, you're talking about the National Guard coming out. The Civil War would have been started right there. It would have been a lot of killing. They probably would have killed that police officer right then and there when they came. Like, if that was a white kid. So I had to just say, how would you feel if we came and beat, because we're always getting beat and harassed and thrown against the ground, the cars by the police all the time. So how would you feel if your white child always come home and say, mom, I'm always getting harassed by these black cops. Like, why? Why is it racism going on? Why do they hate us? And then, unfortunately, someone gets killed that's white by the hand of a black cop. You have to know the feeling. They don't know the feeling. I know they don't know the feeling. You don't know the feeling. So I have to paint that horrific picture to you so you can be like, whoa, okay. Yeah, I, I would be, I'll be pissed off too, or, you know. Yeah, because even uh, at the, toward the end of the song, I was trying to do it more in order, but even it, it relates to the end of the song where, you know, you're talking about, uh, how you would kill the officer and then, you know, you had to dream that his mom yelled and screamed and, and now she knows how the black, black people feel. I think that's also powerful that you put it twice in the song in different parts, but then also showing the generational effect because regardless of what any person could say, this is a son or a daughter that's been killed and the parents are going to feel the pain. The family's going to feel the pain. The community's going to feel the pain. And for whatever reason, I fortunately have grown up to where I've understood this since I was a very little kid. So it's not, this is not news to me how this makes people feel because I've seen it myself and I've been seen it 
having the people I know, so it's not shocking to me. But for you, putting it in music, you know, I think always has a an extra layer. So by saying it, how do you feel you can reach or help, or at least spread the word of it a little bit? Of what? Help what? Well, because you're you're saying like how blacks feel. Like I don't. I think your song, but now I think we're seeing it a little bit more in the media coverage for the first time, probably, maybe ever. Yeah. But I think there is kind of like, this is how black people feel. This is what's been happening to black people. This is, and it just seems like there is a slight bit of understanding, awakening that's happening for white No, people. you're right. I've I seen a lot of things like, um, to me, I don't want to, uh, questions anybody's sincerity right but i always say how sincere are you or you're just doing this to be politically correct i, I want to know how sincere you are so i need to have these conversations with some of these people that are acting like they're remorseful of what their ancestry did to my people and i know a lot of them do feel like wow this is really going on i apologize for it i have a, i have tons of white friends so, and they've been calling me ever since then, like your song is powerful, we needed this. But a lot of them, I think they are waking up just a little bit like, wow, okay, this is happening right in front of our eyes. We're just, we're not paying any attention at all. Now, globally, the whole world is in an uproar. Now they're like, okay, this is a serious issue that we're having and we've been having it. It's just now uh, they hearing us a little bit. And I just say a little bit, we, we, we're getting attention a little bit. I think a lot of uh, other white people, because I don't want to make this a race thing, and it's, it's really about the law and the system, really. But like I was just having a conversation earlier, um, everything that's happening is taught behavior. We only do what we're taught. So these people, you don't, you're not born a bigot. Bigotry is taught. You're not born a racist. Racism is taught. Everybody sounds good on a record if I say I was born cripping. No, I was not. It was taught to me. You feel me? It may sound good if I rap it, but I, I was not. So everything that we do is taught behavior, and I really believe in that. Even with the burning down, and I may be getting off subject because it's just this whole this whole thing is just I'll be talking forever. Like the whole burning down of uh, Black Wall Street, I tell them like, so we're riding the Lord, Lord, uh, looting. We got it from you guys. It's taught behavior. We're talking about the burning it. of the crosses. The burning of uh, just to make sure people know what you're referring to. You're referring to Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. So like people should look that up if they're not familiar with it. When white lynch mobs and mobs uh, burned down what was known as Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it was a amazingly prosperous, fruitful, progressive area in Tulsa, Oklahoma that was you know, black community that was thriving and the white people didn't like it, so they came and looted it and burned it down. So back to what you were saying. Talk behavior. Right. We only do what we talk. On the lowest scale, one plus one is two. Where we taught that. Now, it could be wrong, right? We don't know that. It could be wrong. But since the majority of the world say one plus one is two, we're going to ride with that. It's talk behavior. We te I have four children. I teach them a lot of things. They only do what they've been taught. I told my mother this the other day because she loves the song. I say, Mom, I only knew about religion and going to church because you and Granny taught me to do that. If you would have never taught me, I would have never went. So going back to that, it's just taught behavior. So a lot of these dudes probably don't really have malice in their heart towards the black community, but they was just taught that by other people. Like the, the video that just went viral with the little white girl talking to her dad. He doesn't know he's being recorded. And she like, Dad, what do you mean? He's like, I be in the ghetto all the time. That's how they want to live and all that. He's trying to teach that to her, but she sees a different light because she probably has numerous of black friends. She like, Dad, that's really not it. <laughs> but he's trying to teach her how to be. And so, if she becomes that, it's because it's taught behavior. Everything that we do is taught behavior. So what I was telling my homeboys as well, too, we need to unlearn and reteach some things because we all been learning the wrong things for a long time, even with my own community. Absolutely. I think that's an important message. And one of the things 
that I'm curious to get your opinion on because I've wondered this myself. You mentioned a lot of the other victims of police brutality in your song, like Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, uh, Trayvon, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, there's hundreds and thousands of victims like that. Some we know, some we never know. But what do you think with George Floyd in particular and his death made it to where there's such a bigger reaction than we got from the Eric Gardner death, the Sandra Bland death, the even Trayvon by comparison? Everything was on camera. We know that. This is, this is the day and age of technology, social media. Everything is right then and there. I just think the, 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 carelessness, the, the carelessness of his action, the police officer, I forget his name, and how nonchalant he was to just stick his, ne uh, his knee on that man's neck for so long, and he was begging for his life, telling you he couldn't breathe. Eric Gardner's first with I can't breathe. He was first. He's telling you can't breathe. He's telling you I'm dying. He's calling for his mom. Other people around are really trying to say, stop this and all that. But of course, they're scared too, because they're scared if, if I jump in and try to help, I may get killed. Right. So I think this just went national and just went, it, it's just the way he did it, bro. Because I'm just, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking away because I'm trying to figure out what, what other atrocities we've seen on camera. There's numerous of them, but it's just this one right here is just, Oh, Rodney King. It really just seemed like it just really just seemed like he just didn't give a fuck. The right. other ones, I'm not giving them no type of slack. They were just being real aggressive. The Eric Gordon was, they just really wanted him to get down because he was a big dude. You can see they was kind of afraid because he was big. So they attacked him from the back and tried to like really hold him down. He was saying he couldn't breathe, but you know, they probably thinking that you just saying that because you want to get up and we're, we're nervous, I guess, quote unquote. So he was big. A lot of other people. They look a little bit, well, shit, George is big, too, so I can't say that. It's just maybe Soren, honestly, I, I really can't pinpoint it, but to me, I just think everybody's just tired of seeing it, and that one right there was just, it just seemed like he really just didn't give a fuck, honestly. That's, that, that's what I think. Because you just look at the video. I hate looking at it, but when you look at it, I keep looking at it, and I keep playing it, and I'm just looking like, look at the space expression. Right. Like, he just really don't care. Hands in his pocket, looking away, shimmying back and forth. That means you're putting extra pressure on there. I don't, I don't know, bro. And I guess people were just like, I can't believe that he did this. And he knew he was getting recorded, bro. He knew it. He knew he was getting recorded. He just didn't care. I think everybody is mad about the way that he did it, and they just knew he didn't care at all. Be sure to check out the History of Gangsta Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangsta Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangsta Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your MTV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.